welcome to our Unit 3A video. We are restarting the flipped classroom, so to begin that, we're going to kind of go back over Unit 2 information that we struggled with. So, we have some student questions. Again, remember, this is a video. Pause, rewind, slow it down as you need to. So, here are student questions for inverses. Can you answer these five questions by Friday? Then you get our topic. Can you answer these three questions about the law of sine and cosine by Friday? Then you understand this topic. Can you answer these seven questions about graphing by Friday? Then you understand this topic. And these will pop back up in every section. So inverses. We're going to start with what an inverse is, how to graph it, and how to solve it. Here are those questions one more time, but let's just dive on in. First of all, what is an inverse? The formal definition of an inverse is a function with a one-to-one, -one, so that means one X for every Y, a function that is reflected over the origin line. So here I have a square root function. In red, I've now created the origin line, y equals x. If it was the other way around, then we would have y equals negative x. Cool. So now in the dotted line, I have actually graphed the inverse of that square root function. I think it's x squared plus 2 or something like that, minus 2. Who knows what I did? But you can clearly see that there are reflection points over this origin line. That is what an inverse is. But then you might say, what about in trig? Same concept. In the dotted line, we have arc sine. In the solid line, we have sine. And then there in red is your inverse line, reflecting over. But how do we test this? Okay, so recall that you tested an inverse. Either you used a t-chart, figuring out that there was one y for every x, one x for every y, or you did a vertical line test. But if you can do the vertical line test for the inverse, you can do the horizontal line test for the, sorry, if you can do the vertical line test for the function, you can do the horizontal line test for the inverse. Why is this so important? Well, this image is going to show us exactly why this is important. Not all functions are an inverse all over, but you can restrict a function to be an inverse wherever. So in this case, this portion from here to here is an inverse and this portion from here to here is an inverse as well. But as the line turns red, it doesn't pass the horizontal line test. So we would restrict this function. It would be an inverse in some parts and not an inverse in another part. This is very important as we talk about inverse trig. So just a recall about inverse uh, trig equations and how we set them up. Normally, you would set them up as sine of some angle was equivalent to the sides of your angle. But in an inverse, you literally flip these values. So now you have the inverse sine of the sides of the triangle must be equal to the angle. So what are we solving when we solve an inverse function in trig? You're specifically looking for the missing angle. There is one more way that we can represent sine, and that's using this arc sine. There are... Um, various reasons why there is inverse sine and arc sine. It has to do with which branch of mathematics or engineering you're in, coding, this, that, and the other. It just has to do with syntax. It really does, but they are interchangeable. Okay, why do we solve inverses? One more time, what specific side of the triangle are we solving for? The missing angle. Okay, but how do we solve it? There's multiple methods. Um, how I've taught you guys is to use tricks. So obviously you're going to do your tricks, but backwards. Or if you're using the entire unit circle, you're going to use your unit circle, but backwards. Okay, but there is one important thing that you have to add into those tricks and those that unit circle. You have to know your domain restriction. So let's visualize that for a moment. Here's the formal definition of our domain restrictions for our three um, arc functions, arc sine, arc cosine, and arc tan. However, I don't really need you memorizing this formality. What I need you to understand is the visual representation. So to summarize, arc sine can only be in quadrant one and quadrant four, or the right hand side, arc cosine, quadrant one, quadrant two, arc tan, etc. However, let me fix that. Let me fix your knowledge. It's not quite quadrant one and quadrant four. It's actually quadrant one and quadrant or negative quadrant one. And why is this? So for arc sine and arc tan, I can cross out the entire left hand side. But let's say I have a value that's somewhere down here. I want to get to this line right here. All right, so I start, what happens? I hit a restriction. I cannot go that direction. So what's the only other way to go? The negative direction. So that means we have quadrant one and we have negative quadrant one. So there's a visual representation why our values actually exist in quadrant one and negative quadrant one. So here's that visual representation. You can obviously, we've restricted this domain because it wouldn't work. Here you can see the visual representation of reflecting over the y equals x line. Here is the same thing for cosine. 
And finally, the same thing for tangent. Moving forward, how do we use our unit circle with the inverse with y? Well, sine is always going to be your y value. So if I have, if I know the inverse sine of one half, then that means my answer was pi over 6, or negative 1 half, then you might say my answer is 11 pi over 6, but if you remembered, if this is pi over 6, and I cannot go all the way around to 11 pi over 6, this is actually negative pi over 6. So that's how you use sine. What about cosine? Again, cosine is just the x. So if I was looking for the square root of 3 over 2, that would be pi over 6, or the negative square root of 3 over 2, that would actually be 5 pi over 6. Two answers. That's it. What about tangent? This one gets a little funky. For those of you who memorize the unit circle or the first quadrant as your trick, I want you to recognize this basic formula right here. We know tangent comes from sine over cosine, or it comes from y divided by x, or y times 1 over x, or whatever, however you want to see that formula. There's an easier way to see it. If you know that tangent is simply the y numerator over the x numerator, you're good to go. So here I'll show you. 0 divided by 1. Great, that's 0. 1 divided by the square root of 3. That's 1 over the square root of 3 or the square root of 3 over 3. Square root of 2 over the square root of 2. That is 1. Square root of 3 over 1. That is the square root of 3. 1 divided by 0. Uh-oh, that's undefined or infinite. Guess what? Those are my five tangent values. So kind of get in that process. But let's solve something. Let's say I was looking for the square root of 3 over 3. I already told you that one. That's this one. So I go through and I check all of my y over x numerators. Okay, this one can't be it. 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 By process of elimination, it is this. And if I remember how to rationalize, I can see that they are the same exact value. Cool. What if I was looking for tangent of negative square root of 3 over 1, then that would be this value right here, which would normally give you 5 pi over 3. But again, tangent and sine, they are quadrant 1 and negative quadrant 1, so it would have been negative pi over 3 would be my answer. That's simple. All right, let's move on to our hand trick or our chart trick. So if we have our hand trick or our chart trick, we can't forget to astica. Uh, we can't forget our domain restrictions, depending on what it is. And then we just simply go backwards. So if it's our hand trick, let's say I'm looking for sine of one half. Then that sine formula, square root of the bottom over two. So the twos will cancel. And I'm looking for one finger from the bottom. So I count one finger and I fold the next. You can test it backwards, but this is pi over six. If I was a positive answer, my answer would be pi over 6. If it was a negative 1 half, my answer would be negative pi over 6. But let's test it. What's the sine of pi over 6? It's the square root of 1 over 2, which is 1 half. So it works. If you're doing the chart trick, instead of doing A, B, or sorry, instead of doing A, B, and then C, right, because you would say I have sine of pi over 6 is equal to 1 half, you're going to do A, B, C. So if I know one half, I'm searching for a sign, then I go back to the angle. So that's just how you use those two tricks. So here's my first example, inverse sine of one half. I'm going to use the hand trick just to make my life go quick. I'm going to put this on here. All students take calculus. So I can't have the left-hand side. Sine is going to be bottom. So one fold the next. So that means this is pi over 6 or negative pi over 6. How do I check? Well, 1 half is positive. Where is sine positive? In A. So then my answer is pi over 6. Let's try arc sine of negative square root of 2 over 2. What's the only difference between this over word and this word? Nothing. They mean the same thing. So I count two fingers from the bottom. 1, 2. Fold the next. That's pi over 4. So my answers are currently pi over 4 or negative pi over 4. How do I determine? Is it negative or positive? Well, it's negative. Sine can only be negative in this quadrant. So there's my answer. Yes, it is that simple. All right, let's try cosine. I'm going to cross out the whole bottom this time. Cosine is from the top. So I count two fingers from the top. Boom. Okay, so that means my value is pi over 4. Or, not this time negative pi over 4, but it's going to be 3 pi's over 4. So I ask myself, where is cosine negative? It's negative in this quadrant, so my answer is 3 pi over 4. What about negative 2? Okay, well, I think about it. There's two different ways I could look at this. So negative 2. So 
where is that? Hold on. My formula is the square root of the top divided by 2. So if I set that equal to 2 over 1, what happens here? There is no correlation, right? So then maybe I think, okay, well, maybe it's somehow simplified, and it was negative 4 over 2. So let's count four fingers from the top. 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, so maybe it's 0. So let's test that out. The cosine of 0 is not negative 2, is it? Uh-oh. So then I remind you, what are all of your values? What are all of these fingers equal to? Think about all of your x, y values. They go from 0 to a half to the square root of 2 over 2 to the square root of 3 over 2 to 1. And that's it. They toggle between those values, positive and negative. So all sine values and cosine values toggle between 1 and negative 1 unless they've been transformed that's a totally different story, and as we move to solving, you're going to understand you're still going to toggle between 1 and negative 1 because you're going to get rid of all the outside. But anyway, we're toggling between 1 and negative 1, so can my sides ever equal negative 2? Not the way it is, so it is undefined. What about tangent? This is the one that messes up a lot of kids. So again, I can't have the left-hand side. I know that the square root of 3 over 3 is actually 1 over the square root of 3. So then I go to tangent. In this one, I'm not counting bottom. I'm not counting top. But I'm figuring out top over bottom. Top, right, the sine value, 1, over the bottom, which is the cosine value. Sorry. Sine, cosine, that's what I was trying to say. Bottom over top, bottom over top. Tangent is bottom over top. I'm showing you the physical, but I'm not saying the right word. Sorry. So tangent is going to be 1 over 3. Where did it happen? Let me show you that one more time. One finger, sine, over three fingers, cosine, is my fraction 1 over the square root of 3. So what finger did I fold down? I folded down pi over 6 or negative pi over 6. So I ask myself, where is tangent positive? It's positive in this quadrant, so my answer is pi over 6. And if you go back a few seconds to watch that part, part where I show you all the tangent values, you can prove it to yourself that this is that same spot. All right, so here's your first pause and do. I hope you get it. Otherwise, it's going to take you back. Alrighty, so graphing inverse trig procedures. So how do we graph the trigs? First, you have to identify the inverse. Basically, solve away all the nonsense, and I'm going to show you that. Create a table. Typically, you're plugging in a y value to solve for x because it's an inverse, and I'll show you what that means visually. Plot your lines, connect the dots, and voila, you're done. It's that simple. It's just like creating any graph. You just t-chart and go. But because it's an inverse, you have to start a little funkier. Let's say I'm given this. Y is equal to arc, kind, arc cosine 2x. For those of you who struggle seeing arc cosine, I could rewrite it like this. Y is equal to the inverse cosine of 2x. So how do I figure out an inverse? I switch my equals and what's inside the parentheses. So now it becomes this. 2x and y literally switched places. And cosine inverse became standard cosine. How do I get x by itself? I divide the 2. Ta-da! Now I have x is equal to 1 half cosine y. These are kind of interchangeable formulas. The only difference is one has a restriction, the other technically does not, so you'd have to restrict it yourself. But anyway, we're going to do that in the t-chart. So we're ready to make our table, and we're really graphing this right now. But in order to make sure we have everything correct in this table, we're going to ask ourselves what our domain and range restrictions are. So if you recall that the domain restriction of arc cosine is to cut out the whole bottom half, that means that you are allowed to go from 0 to pi. So if that's the domain of inverse cosine, then that must be the range of cosine. So that's why I'm going to plug in from 0 to pi and fill in all my other values. Where did all my other values come from? Those are just values found on the standard unit circle. The only one I skipped was pi over 3 and 2 pi over 3. I could have added those in, but for my screen, I just, you know, I needed a little bit of space, so I just set it to this. But anyway, so now I'm literally going to plug in each of these values. So cosine of 0 and then times 1 half, cosine of pi over 4 and then times 1 half, cosine of pi over 6 and then times 1 half. And that's what I end up with. Literally, I plugged them in. Now I'm ready to graph it. So here I created a graph. I'm going to graph my y's. Then I'm going to graph my x. Then I'm going to create some dots and connect the dots. And if I check it with a calculator, ta-da, the same graph. All right, are you ready to try it yourself?
If you're not, maybe rewind. Otherwise, here's your question. All right, so moving on to the law of sines and the law of cosines. So when do we use it? How do you differentiate? What is the ambiguous case? So when do you use the laws? Well, you're probably not using a right triangle. Not that you can't do the law of sine and cosine with a right triangle. It's just that why wouldn't you use the easier right triangle theorems, right? Pythagorean's theorem, so Katoa, et cetera. Don't forget that 180 degree theorem still applies, you know, how many angles in your triangle? Three. They must all add to 180. One concept that will happen in the ambiguous case that I'm not going to mention in this video is just recalling from geometry. If this was 150 degrees, then what is this angle? 30 degrees. Or if this was 20 degrees, what is this angle? 160 degrees. Just recalling this information would help you with the ambiguous case. But we can practice that in class again. So, a little bit of a law, like a little bit of rules for law of sine and cosine. Peanut butter and jelly tells me you can figure out your own pattern. But my pattern is I want to use the law of sine when I have my three out of four rule. Or you can see that as one visible variable. I know I want to use the law of cosines when I have two sides and an angle and I'm solving for the angle side. Or I have all three sides and I'm solving for one of the angles. You may have triangles where you end up using both the law of sines and the law of cosines. And that's okay. And finally, don't forget the ambiguous case. Specifically, it's side-side angle. And I know some of you might look at that and read it backwards, and so I might say, this is the donkey case. So if you have a donkey case, this is where your angle is not between your two sides. So I can't visualize it because there is an ambi there's ambiguity, uh, ambiguity with it. You can look at the image to kind of see that or come see me if you need more examples of why it's ambiguous. But the reality of it is, is if you have a side-side angle case, you have to test it first. When looking at my chart, A means the angle side, B means the other side, and capital A is the given angle, oops, typo, angle that is opposite of side A. So let's see. Here's the law of sines. It is a proportion. You don't need all three fractions. You only need four or four parts, okay? So this is what I mean by three of four parts. Let's say I have a real number here and a real number here and a real number here. That's one, two, three and only one visible variable, okay? So that's all I mean by how do I use and set up my law of signs. What about the ambiguous side? Again, I have that typo here. This is supposed to say angle, my bad. Here's the visual representation of why it's ambiguous. And again, in this example, A is not your A. B is not your B. Capital A is not your capital A. If you have, you have to check. A is the angle side, B is the other side. A is the given angle that is opposite of A. Some, a formula to recall is H is equal to B sine of A. So again, H is equal to the other side times sine of the angle. That's what it means. All right, here's my chart that I provide. Here, the, the angle side is less than the other side and the angle side is less than H. Angle side is less than the other side, angle is equal to A. Angle side is less than the other side, angle side is greater than H. Angle side is greater than the other side. That's what this means. This acute references capital A. This obtuse references capital A. It has nothing to do with your two solution question where you have acute and obtuse. That is separate. All right. So here is my first question. Solve this triangle. I know it's an angle, angle side, so it's probably law of signs. But just in case, why not set up all three fractions and test from there? So if I start with sine of 35 degrees, its side is little a is equal to sine of 103 degrees. Its side is 20 is equal to sine of capital C and its side is little c. So if I cover up portions of it, so let's say I cover up the first fraction, how many variables? Ooh, two variables. If I cover up the middle fraction, again, three variables. If I cover up the last fraction, ooh, now I have one variable, right? Right here, I only have one variable. So now I cross multiply. This 20 comes in front, 20 sine 35. This A comes in front, A sine 103. Now how do I get A by itself? That's easy. I can divide by sine of 103. I plug this into a calculator and I get my answer. And because I wanna make sure we all understand the calculator, I'm gonna go ahead and do this. I am in degrees. Okay, calculator, what was ours? Okay, and let's get our fraction going. And this is 20 
sine 35 over sine of 103. And our answer for A is 11.77. And because I know I was in degrees and these are in degrees, I know my answer should be correct. So I'm going to say that A is equal to 11.7. It wants us to solve the entire triangle, okay? So that would be, you know, you could set up the rest. How would I solve for angle C? That's the 180 degree theorem. I know two angles, that means I always know the third. I'll say that one more time. If I know two angles, I always know the third. I subtract from 180. From there, I can set up and solve for little c. It's that simple. All right, here is yours. Here's your turn number, ooh, this should say number one. I think I switched my slides on accident. Solve capital K. That means solve angle K. Cool. Moving on. This should be number two. Solve little letter L. So this one, you have to actually set up the law of signs. All righty. What about the ambiguous case? So let's say I have this information. How would I set it up using this? Uh-oh, typo. That should say two. This should say one. Okay. So... This is the angle I'm given. So I'm going to just make any old triangle. M, N, L, M, N, O. Okay. So this is 94 degrees. Its side is 15. This side is 12. So I check, whoa, I have an angle that's not between my sides. That means I have a side-side angle. Or if you read that backwards, it's a donkey case. So I must test it. So I ask myself, the angle side is what to 12? Well, it's greater than 12. So that means I'm looking at this case right here. One solution, simple as that, simple as pi. But let's say this said 12 and this said 15. That means 12 is less than 15. Then I'm looking at these three solutions. So I still need to solve my H value. It's gonna be equal to the other side times sine of the angle. So you figure out what that is. Let's just call it Let's make our lives easy uh, and call it, let's call it 12. So then if 12 equals 12, you're looking at this where A equals H and you again have one solution. If it was less than, you'd have no solutions. That means it's not a true triangle. If you had greater than, then you're talking about our two solution case. So really quickly, let me talk about that. What that means is you would have had a triangle that looked like this and potentially a triangle I don't know if I drew the right angles at the right spot, but that looked like this. So basically, this is 94 and is not going to change. And I know I realize they're not drawn to scale because that should be over a uh, right triangle. Just bear with me. Oh, wait, this, this question can't work. Miss Jag, you did something crazy. Ah, the very first thing I should have checked is whether this was obtuse or acute. My bad. It is obtuse. So I solved this thinking as if this was a less than 90 degree angle, but it's not, it's obtuse, it's greater than 90 degrees. So again, 15 is greater than 12, so I still have one solution. So we're still okay there. But let's pretend this was a Q, we'll call it 64 degrees. And I have a two solution problem, there's a typo here. Then this is 64 degrees, and then I'm gonna solve, uh, what is this, this is M, then this is, M and O, so this is M, little M, and this is little M. Okay, and this is little O. So that means that O could truly change. It could also look like this. Sorry, N can truly change. Miss Jag is all sorts of crazy today. How do I draw an obtuse triangle? There we go. So this is still 64 degrees, but now this angle has changed. And this is where I said, if you recognize your complementary angles, complementary, supplementary, supplementary, complementary. Uh, if you remember that you got a line here and that if it's 180 degrees, that total line, you subtract from 180. And that's where this information comes from. I get that this slide was all sorts of crazy. I want you to still give it a try. I feel like I could talk kind of quickly through it because we did practice this all last week, doing three days of bingo with the law of sines and the law of cosines. So again, this is just a reset recall. But what about the law of signs? So recognizing here, I could have given you any of these formulas. I don't have to give you all three because no matter what, the outside value are matching, right? Side to its angle, side to its angle, side to its angle. No matter what, these are the other sides and these are also the other sides. So it's the same pattern each time. So let's set that up. 
We have this information. You can read about the hockey player and they gave you this image. So to make my life easier, I recognize that because I have three sides, I'm using the law of cosine and I'm going to go ahead and redraw that triangle, make it nice, big and easy for me. So my formula is uh, what are we looking for? The player shot angle. So this side I'm looking for angle A. So if I'm looking for angle A, then that means I'm going to do cosine of A. That means out here it should be little a. So everything else should be all my other letters, all my other numbers. Okay. So this is little c, this is little b, and this is little a. So this becomes 6 squared is equal to 20 squared plus 24 squared minus 2 times 20 times 24 cosine of a. I can subtract these, 6 squared minus 20 squared minus 24 squared equals negative 2 times 20 times 24 cosine of A. I can divide this, and now what is the only way to get the angle away from trig? You have to use the inverse. So this becomes inverse cosine of all of this simply equals A. And the reason I did all of this instead of putting any of this information into the calculator is some of you need to recognize the pattern that was formed here. I see kids moving these over as addition instead of subtraction. They subtract and add this instead of dividing. I'm seeing some funky order of operations, so I'm, I'm just showing you the true pattern. But if I plug that into my calculator, I end up with 6 squared minus 20 squared what is it, minus 24 squared all over negative 2 times 20 times 24. Oops, this is all supposed to be in parentheses, and this is supposed to be, uh, I might have messed this up. Let's see if I can do this. Copy, paste, cool, okay. And we end up with 11.7. I am in degrees, so we're good there. So now I know that angle A is equal to 11.7 degrees. And that's it. That's all you have to do with these types of questions with law of sine. Okay, um, what if, just briefly, what if I didn't know 6, but I knew that angle A was 11.7, then I could set up A squared is equal to 20 squared plus 24 squared minus 2 times 20 times 24 cosine of 11.7. The only thing left to do here is get rid of the square, and guess what? I'm ready to do all of that in a calculator. So again, I'm trying to help you all out because some of you, when you're doing those small maths, 20 squared, 24 squared, negative 2 times 20 times 24, sometimes we're making some funky order of operation errors, and then you get funkiness in your calculator or you don't get the right answer. You, you get scared that it's not the right answer. Remember. It might just be the calculator. It might be your order of operations. Know your PEMDAS forward. Know your PEMDAS backwards and how that works. All right. Here is your turn. You have an image. Work through it. And you are solving uh, the angle that is formed by the two trails that lead to the camp. So I'll help you out. If this is your camp and these are the two trails, this is the angle you're looking for. All right. Try it. Moving forward. Graphing trig. So this is where a lot of kids got stuck. So can you answer these questions? Then you are really ready. Here's my favorite graph. And just a recall, it really is as simple as following the formula, plugging them in, shifting, and going from there. So here's one period of each graph. If you don't know what these six look like, you're going to have a hard time. Tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant. But today, right now, we're focusing on sine and cosine. So... You have this, but I broke it down for you. Amplitude is your X, period is your Y, vertical shift is your K value, so like your up and down movement, period shift is your left to right movement, and it does what you think it does. So if it's negative, it moves left. If it's positive, it moves to the right. So here is some information I gave you, but really let's just dive on in. So the first thing we have to do is plug it all in. So here's my formula chart. I wrote it all out perfectly color coded for you so you can see exactly what your A, B, and C, K were. C and K can be zero, but A and B cannot be zero. They are coefficients, they are attached. So if they are invisible, they are equal to one. 
So I'll say that again. C and K, if they're invisible, they are zero. A and B, because they're coefficients, if they're invisible, they are one. Okay, so I plug it in, plug it in, boom, I got all my information. Now, how do I graph that? First, I'm going to label my amplitude. Again, that's the x-axis, my highest x, my lowest x. Then I'm going to label my y-axis. Okay, but that's, you know, it's reminding you that sine is going to start at zero. Cosine would have started at a or negative a. So identify your period. You're going to cut them into fourths. Okay, then you're going to label them. So 2 pi, 2 pi times a half, 2 pi times 3 quarters, 2 pi times one, uh, one quarter. So again, what is this formula that I did? This is period. This is three fourths times period. This is one half times period. This is one fourth times period. If you do not, if you don't get this concept, it's because you are avoiding your fraction math. Stop avoiding it. I literally did two pi here. Two pi times three fourths becomes six fourths becomes three halves pi. Two pi times one fourth becomes two over four becomes one half right here. 2 pi times 1 half becomes 2 over 2 becomes 1 right here. That's literally all I did. Okay, what about the vertical shift and uh, period shift? We have an example coming up with that, but first of all, I need to know my five points. A lot of you, this is where we saw the most problems. You're putting your points wherever you want. You're starting here and then you've got points all willy-nilly, a million maxes and mins. Stop doing that. These dash marks have a purpose. They are literally your points of intersection. Whether it's a max point, a min point, or your x-intercepts, they are important points. Now I can connect the dot. So there, I giraffe that graph. Cool. Now let's see a cosine question. I solved everything. Now I'm going to label my x-axis. Then I'm going to label my y-axis. Again, this is going to be pi over 2, then pi over 2 times 3 fourths, pi over 2 times 1 half, pi over 2 times 1 fourth. So that's where these values came from. Cosine is going to start at a or negative a. Because it's positive, it's going to start at a, not negative a. So I create my points, intersect, min, intersect, max, and then I graph it. That's it. Now let's look at a shift. This is where I know we struggle with. So completing all the same initial steps. Here are my points. Why don't I want to draw yet? Because I want to shift the points. A lot of you guys are drawing and trying to shift the graph. It doesn't work that way. It's the points that shift because that's what really matters. Everything else is connect the dots. So how am I shifting this? I'm shifting up by, or sorry, down by three, and I'm shifting to the right by pi. So there we go, down by 3, right by pi. So each point is literally going to go right by pi, down by 3, 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 and there's one more coming, and right by pi and down by 3. Now I'm allowed to graph this. Ta-da! That's how you should be graphing all of your sine and cosine graphs. And this is why you end up with an invisible graph before or whatever it was. All right. Here's your question. I really hope you can succeed with this. What about graphing other tricks? So focus right now is going to be tangent, cotangent. Don't forget what each of these graphs look like. Here is that information. The A is no longer your, it's going to be your x-axis, but it's no longer your max and min. It's going to be your bendy point. I'll show you that in just a second. Your period is still going to be from start to finish, but with tangent, you've got a funky thing. And this is where a lot of kids messed up. Vertical shift up and down, period shift left and right. Okay. Again, you can copy this down, but here we go. So I plug it in, but before I can plug it in, what the heck do I mean by not amplitude? There are no maxes and mins, but you have a bendy part of your tangent graph. So I want you to remember the bendy straw, and every time you're going to connect at that bendy point, and I'll show you what I mean. So I plug in all my values, and I'm ready to start labeling my amplitude. So there's my one-third and negative one-third. Now I'm ready to label my period. Tangents are only funky one, not even cotangent. Tangent is the only one where instead of four tick marks to the right of the origin, you're going to do four tick marks straddling the origin. So there are my four tick marks. So instead of this being period 
three quarts of a period, half a period, and a fourth of a period. Guess what? This is now half a period, a fourth of a period, negative a fourth of a period, and negative a half of a period. Again, if you can't fill out those four values, it's because you're avoiding fraction math. You're not taking this value and multiplying it by a half, by a fourth, negative fourth, negative a half. You have to do that. So there's where my numbers came from. Now, where is my not amplitude? Here's my bendy point. Well, first we mark the center. Here's my bendy point. Here's my other bendy point. How did I know that this bendy point was down here and not here? That's the standard graph of tangent goes from down to up. If it was negative tangent, it would go from up to down. My outer points are going to be my asymptotes. A lot of you are forgetting to graph the asymptotes. You're going to start losing points. Then connect D the dots. Boom. That's my giraffe. Ta-da. What about cotangent? So here again, I've labeled, filled out my graph, I mean my, my table, I've labeled my x3 and my negative x3. Now, cotangent is still 4 to the right. Tangent's the only funky one. Tangent's the one that straddles. So now, normal period. Here, I've got a weird point. So if tangent's middle point was the origin, where is cotangent's middle point? If you guessed right here, you're correct. So my asymptotes are on the outside. There's my middle point. Those are my bendy points. And why am I going from down to up? Normally, cotangent goes from up to down, but because it's negative, we have to do the opposite. I graph, and I'm good to go. That's it. All right. Here is a shifted cotangent. So start the same way. Here's my period. Here are my asymptotes. Here are my three points. Again, standard cotangent goes from top to bottom, but now I have to shift those points. And I'm going to shift to the left by pi over 2, so there's my shift. I'm also going to shift up by 1, so there's my shift again. Now, here's my new graph, and I draw those. So again, I'll show you that one more time. I shifted to the left by pi over 2, which is two tick marks, right? One, two. Then I shifted up. Ooh, went the wrong way. Then I shifted up. So these are the new dots I'm actually going to graph with. Ta-da! Cool. Now let's move to secant and cosecant. Again, recalling one period of each graph. Here's secant and cosecant. Guess what? Why do these look so familiar? Because they are sine and cosine. So you're actually going to graph sine and cosine. Then you're going to kiss my asymptotes. And what that means is at your maxes and mins, those are your kissing points. At your not maxes and mins, those are your asymptotes. So let me show you that. So I graphed secant as if it's cosine, which means I graphed cosecant as if it's sine. Boom. Now I've graphed cosine. Here, I'm going to kiss, so those are these points, my mins and my maxes, and I'm going to asymptote everywhere else. And at my kissing points, I redraw in the opposite direction. In pink is the actual graph of secant. Technically, negative 1 has secant x, but that is the actual graph of secant. Now, you woo, erase the other parts, and you're left with this. Ta-da! If I was asking you to do this on a test, you would probably, instead of erasing this part, you would have this in dots or these in dots or something. You'd have a way to differentiate for me what's the actual graph and what's the original. Boom. What about cosecant? Again, I'm graphing sine. I do everything. There's my sine graph. I kiss at the maxes. I oops, asymptote at the non-maxes. I redraw. There we go. I redraw and erase and voila. There's my answer. It's that simple. What about a shift? Okay, so here's my original sign, but I kiss, redraw, erase. Uh oh, did I shift? I didn't shift, Miss Jag. Okay, so we should have moved to the right by pi over four. So let me draw on top of this. Okay, so we should have shifted every dot to the right by pi over 4, which is two tick marks. So this comes here, this comes here, this comes here, this comes here, and this comes all the way over here. So here is my actual original sign. I am going to kiss here, kiss here, asymptote, asymptote asymptote. So there we go. That's what my end graph should have looked like. All right. And I think that's all I've got for you. So just a recap. You identify the trig function. If it's sine cosine, great. That's the easiest. If it's tangent, that's the funky. The period straddles. 
Okay, if it's cotangent, normally just move it to the right. If it's secant and cosecant, graph sine and cosine and kiss your asymptotes. Ta-da, we're done.